started, I'm going to be color commentating for Quintet 3. It's going to be this Friday at the Orleans. And um, it's pretty exciting grappling style matchups and uh, just the way it's laid out I find it really interesting because it's like sort of a relay if you, if you think of like a relay and grappling meeting each other um, and it's also sort of marries the idea of open weight classes because um, you don't know who you're going to be grappling if you, if you submit the first matchup you're on to the second person of the team so potentially the first person on each team those teams of five can eliminate the entire other team and no one else on their team would even get to go. Hypothetically speaking, it could could happen. We How does this come together? Was this something were you, were you looking to do, you know, add something you're already so busy as it is, were, were you looking to do more work like this? I'm always looking to add. <laughs> I'm never busy enough, you know. Um, I feel like, uh, well, grappling, as you guys know, throughout my fight career, it's just something that I've always been passionate about. And, now that uh, you know I've had a baby and all that good stuff, uh, that's where I keep myself busy. I keep myself preoccupied on the mats with jujitsu, so it's a passion of mine. And I've always loved breaking down live action, whether it be fighting or wrestling or grappling. So it just made sense. It's interesting because there's a couple of different grappling organizations right now. So it's like this kind of surgence of, of grappling. What do you think it is about this organization? You know, the, the unique format. It, 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 do you prefer this one over the others, or you know, how do you think people attach to this one? Well, I think it kind of follows a storyline in the sense that people can can watch or hope for matchups. You know, you get emotionally invested in the sense, like, for instance, as much as I love Sakuraba and I think you know, he, the man is an absolute legend, there's a part of me that really wants to see Uriah submit Sakuraba so I can watch Uriah Faber grapple Josh Barnett. Because he's, Josh Barnett is second in line, and I mean, there's a 100-pound weight discrepancy, but I mean, where are you going to see that anywhere else? I mean, that's really neat. Where, where would you ever see Uriah Faber and Josh Barnett going against each other? Um, I just think it's, it's very fascinating, so I like that whole relay style idea. Are you limiting yourself to the uh, broadcast booth, or do you see yourself getting on a, a, a team at some point? There's, there's no limitations, really. Um, I, I definitely would like to pursue more of a grappling aspect. You know, I want to stay competitive in some format, and I think grappling is really what fits the, fits the bill so far. So I do see myself doing some sort of grappling competition in the future. How does it feel being kind of like a woman out there and trying to put them more on the map when it comes to being a commentator and, you know, radio, you're also hosting a show, so how does that feel to kind of, like, you're one of the first pioneers of the sport and then to carry it on into your broadcasting? Well, I mean, I would say it feels really good. Um, again, I never looked at myself different being a woman in the sport, and I don't look at myself different as being a woman on the, the broadcasting or analyst side of things. You know, I have knowledge that I that I can offer, and I, I love the fact that I can get out there and inform the audience of what's going on. And jujitsu and grappling is my specialty, so I'm very confident being able to inform everybody of exactly what's going on, and uh, I have no nerves with that kind of stuff, so... Uh, it's just, it's fun for me. I, I think, why not? Why not add it to the resume? Speaking of grappling, I mean, a big matchup this weekend with the UFC 229. How do you analyze Khabib's grappling going into that fight? And what's your sort of prediction on how this one plays out? Well, Khabib's grappling and wrestling is very, very good, particularly his wrestling. Um, I wouldn't say that he stands out to me as a submission artist per se, but I think he has a way of wearing people down, getting a hold of you and um, he just throws people around and it's it's incredible because some of the guys that he gets a hold of and, and makes it look easy, like you know that it's not easy because you know that the competition that he's fighting is very legitimate. So he's undefeated in his career, he has yet to lose a round and um, I think it, it favors him in this fight to be honest. However, um, Conor McGregor is not one to be counted out, like you, you never can count him out and I think He's going to be faster, and I think he has a huge advantage on the feet. And his fight IQ is, I mean, some of the best that I've ever seen. The way that he adjusts um, mid-fight if he needs to, and the game plan that he comes with. Um, he's really a next-level athlete, so the fight does start on the feet. And there is definitely a, a good chance that he knows how to get in there, and he's studied the striking, and he'll find that one opportunity. Um, so it's going to be a good fight either way. Um, I either see probably Connor finishing it or, or possibly um, could be getting a decision. Has the uh, door really closed on you returning to the UFC? 
Um, you know, it's one of those things I just haven't really thought about, to be honest. Um, I have been so happy just being a mom. I'm very fulfilled in, in that. And I, you know, I know that, that the door is always open if, uh, if that calling does come back to me. So I'm just kind of letting it, letting it be. Speak of the devil. <laughs> Let's look at those mom ears. Um, she's, you know, she's all that I'm focused on at the moment, and, and everything else that I can fit into my schedule, like being a color commentator for Quintet and grappling and things like that. I, I really feel like that suffices. And, and um, the other thing too is, if you think about it, um, I've done it all. I started from the very, very bottom, uh, you know, getting paid nothing, getting paid pennies on the dollar, to headlining the, one of the you know, biggest fights to ever exist you know in the UFC so I've um, been a world champion for the UFC I've been a strike force world champion I've I've really captured a lot inside you know my relatively short career which was roughly 11 11 and 12 years I mean that's a long career anyway so I don't think I'm missing anything really when you watch fights are you thinking of them kind of with the, the mindset of a fighter still like uh, well what would I do if I'm in there or do you think more like an analyst now I still think of it like a fighter, to be honest. If I'm just sitting at home and I'm watching the fights, it's like, oh man, you should have done this, you should have done that, or I would be doing this, or I could beat that person, you know? Like, you still think about it that way. Yeah. I think that's first and foremost, you know, an, an analyst is second nature to me. You know, thinking like a fighter is first nature. But they go hand in hand, right? I mean, in order to be an analyst, you have to have that experience. That I think it experience. helps. It definitely helps to have been in there and done it, you know, to be able to break it down and know exactly what should be happening. and. Um, and to appreciate the art as it unfolds, so if you've been in there, it helps to have that experience to also be able to translate and break it down to people who are just watching it. How do you see um, the cyborg in that's why going? Uh, I naturally would pick cyborg. I don't think there's a woman on this planet that I would pick to beat cyborg as of right now, and probably not a lot of men either. <laughs> <laughs> so with that being said, I'm uh, definitely picking cyborg, but. I do think that Amanda poses some problems that Cyborg hasn't seen yet. And the biggest one is the power that Amanda possesses. I know she's a smaller athlete, but I believe she'll be faster, and I believe that she possesses the power to hurt Cyborg, which is something that I don't think Cyborg has really had to encounter. Um, I think most of the females that Cyborg's ever fought, um, I don't think they measure up to Amanda's striking power. So, with that being said, I don't think she's going to want to come in there with a, a, you know, a careless game plan. I don't think she can just walk in there and expect to bully Amanda around because I think Amanda is better than that. And um, with that being said, I think that Cyborg is going to win, but I think it might be a tougher fight than anybody's anticipating. Is it the best uh, women's fight in, in UFC history? Think? That's hard to say. I feel like there's a lot of history. Um, you know, there's even in a short amount of time, there's a lot of history that's you know, that's happened. I think that Rose's fight with with Joanna uh, um, Janjacek was an amazing fight. Um, obviously, this is the first time that two champions have fought each other, so it it is in a very important fight. But I don't know if it's the the biggest fight in UFC's Dragon. I suppose it depends how the fight unfolds. To be honest, I think that really has a lot to do with it. I think if it's a great fight and it unfolds, I think it goes down in history as definitely one of the greatest fights to ever happen for women's mixed martial arts. Well, while we're talking about big fights in uh, women's mixed martial arts, uh, Shevchenko versus Eubanks recently just got, not officially announced, but it looks like that's going to be the main event for UFC 230. A lot of people expect it maybe Nate Diaz and first Poirier, maybe for once it's a five pound title. What do you think about that decision? Um, I had a feeling that it wasn't going to be Diaz and Poirier for the simple fact that they went out and tried to make it happen, you know, unofficially on their own. And I think that it sets a precedence, you know, that the UFC has what they have in mind. So um, I love, I love the fact that women's MMA is, is getting represented and is being put on the map. And you know, Shevchenko is one of the biggest stars that has yet to be a champion. Yeah, and she, I think, in everybody else's book, it's like she's the uncrowned champion. It's just a matter of time until she becomes a champion. So uh, I think you know, this is going to be a good fight. Were you surprised they didn't go with Yoani and Janchik instead against Shevchenko? Absolutely. I think that it probably should have been Yoani and Janchik and Valentina Shevchenko. That's the fight that I would have liked to see. But um, hopefully we'll see that in the future. I don't know what the holdup is, but I'm sure there's a good reason. We're going into a, a Conor McGregor fight week now. You were on, you were in the co-main event of the McGregor fight week a couple years ago. Is, 
that experience different as an undercard fighter than other fight cards that, that you've been on, just that, that whole, the whole kind of atmosphere? Uh, uh, being, being, a, being in a McGregor, on, on a McGregor card, you know, with all the um, Irish fans and all the, uh, you know, the atmosphere. Yeah. It's definitely different. I was on one McGregor card, and one I was supposed to be on, but then that fight didn't happen with McGregor, so... Uh, no, two, excuse me. Two cards, yeah, right? Um, it's always way more crazy with those, the fans. Like, it's one of the few times that I remember hearing the audience, like, really chanting. Like, they're just very passionate, so the, to be on a McGregor card is... It's next level. Like, the fans are hyped, and everybody's super, super invested, so... Um, to anybody who hasn't been on a McGregor card yet, just be ready because the, the the charge in the room is pretty incredible. Is it, is it a positive or, or in some ways a negative thing? I think it's a positive. It depends if you feed off that kind of energy or not. Everyone's different, but for me, I really enjoyed hearing that the the audience was passionate about about my fight, that they're invested. You know, I remember. Um, when I was fighting Holly, you know, that they would start chanting Holly's name and then they would rebuttal and start chanting my name and I heard it and it's just like you get that energy and you know that that a lot of those people out there are obviously cheering for you. So you wanna you, you wanna like settle it settle the, the audience dispute and, you know, get that win. <laughs> Misha, with you doing your own um, you know, some radio shows and some commentating you're kind of a part of, of the media now, and I just wonder if, if you have any opinions of when you were a fighter about the media that have changed now that you've become one of us, kind of. Yeah, actually, <laughs> it's really interesting. I, I um, So I work with Ryan McKinnell every Wednesday on Sirius XM, so we host the show together, and it's really fascinating sometimes how he breaks down something versus how I break down something, how he, he thinks about something from the media side. So now I've really started to come full circle and start to understand what it is to be on your on your guys' side of it, you know, behind the camera, the one asking the questions, those kinds of things. And I feel like one of the things that I find the most interesting is that um, it depends how you how you listen to someone when they interview, you know, like how you get your next question. Like I always appreciate it when I feel like someone's engaging with me in conversation as opposed to just asking like the next question. And um, I think that separates good good analysts. So I always try to remember that when I'm doing an interview on SiriusXM that I don't want to just ask a question that I've bulleted out. Like I want to really try to like be engaged and be in there and be in that conversation. It's just not something that I thought about on the other side before. Yeah. Cool. Thank you guys. Okay. Thank you.